Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. alaikum. Welcome to Newsroom. I'm your host, Jumma Khalid. But today is Friday, the 8th of December, 2023. And these are the stories that we'll try to decipher during the course of the show. We'll begin with the latest as far as Pakistan's economic situation is concerned with the PSX that is rising with every passing day. The KSC 100 index has hit a new milestone. It has uh, surged past the 66,000 mark and it settled at 66,223 at the end of closing uh, uh, today which is an extremely good sign as far as Pakistan's economic indicators are concerned and also shows a positive influence as far as the different uh, concerns that uh, the uh, uh, people concerned with Pakistan's economy had and now those have been taken care of. Also, we'll talk about uh, uh, an address at the ceremony of the PSX early in the day where our caretaker Prime Minister Nawarul Hakkar Sahib vowed to sustain and nurture the growth in the capital market. This is going to be our first segment. Our second story, ladies and gentlemen, concerns a grand jirka for peace, prosperity that was held in Balochistan. It was, of course, uh, uh, attended by many important uh, leaders as well as the uh, Chief Minister of Balochistan and also those who were on the wrong side of the law but now have joined in uh, the peace efforts. The whole uh, Jirga, which was the first of its kind, is extremely important. The whole context of peace in Balochistan and uh, all the uh, concerned parties getting together in order to forge a, a unanimous uh, point of view on how to move forward in order to uh, further consolidate peace in, in the region. This is going to be our second segment. Then our third story concerns the latest situation as far as Israel and Gaza is concerned. It's day 63, ladies and gentlemen, and the barbarities don't end, the uh, brutalities don't end, the Israelis continue not only in northern Gaza, not only in southern Gaza, but also in the West Bank. The casualties have surged uh, past uh, the 16,500 mark, in fact, have surged past the 17,000 mark. Uh, the fact also remains that uh, there is a lot of uh, diplomatic push that might be going on at the special session of the United Nations Security Council that is going on as we speak, although we do not have the results of that session as of yet. But there are a lot of speculations that are going on. But of course, we'll be highlighting as and when an official decision comes from the meeting of the UNSC. This is going to be our third segment. Then we are going to talk about Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's son. Ladies and gentlemen, who's been indicted on tax evasion charges. He did not pay uh, an amount of 1.4 million US dollars in federal taxes. He has been charged with the nine counts. A 56 page indictment has been filed in the California uh, District Court against him. Also, there was previous charges uh, that accused him of lying about usage of uh, drugs. Uh, this is going to be our fourth story. Last story, ladies and gentlemen, concerns Azerbaijan and Armenia. This is a very positive step that has happened. Both the countries have decided to work towards a peace deal. Both countries have agreed to uh, for a swap deal as far as the prisoners are, their prisoners are concerned. Azerbaijan will, reserve, uh, will release 32 prisoners while Armenia will free two. Uh, the United States terms this deal an important confidence building measure. So after decades of uh, uh, war, this uh, finally comes through peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan. This is going to be our last story. Let's begin with our first and that concerns Pakistan's stock exchange that has surged past the 66,000. Mark Dr. Vakar Ahmed's leading economist from Pakistan joins us online. Dr. Vakar, thank you very much to have joined us. Dr. Vakar, uh, the KSE 100 index uh, seems, uh, I mean, th there's no sign of it relenting or slowing down. It is inching. Uh, upwards and has a very strong trajectory. What do you attribute the main reasons behind it? Thank you, Marsha. Um, I think uh, two or three things are at play. One is the relative uh, economic stability. You have seen that uh, Pakistan is uh, engaging with IMF in a very favorable manner, and IMF has also claimed that uh, most of the near term conditions which Pakistan had to meet uh, in terms of uh, the revenue targets, uh, the conditions in the energy sector, they have been met. Now, these are, of course, a positive uh, developments for the market. Uh, this is what uh, the domestic and foreign investors wanted to, of course, see for a very long time. Uh, the second uh, factor, I believe, also is the news coming from outside of Pakistan, where, of course, uh, uh, you may have seen that uh, investor confidence seems to be gradually reviving, uh, particularly very positive interest coming from the GCC countries. And uh, the external uh, finance requirements, uh, uh, both in case of uh, Saudi Arabia or China, 
the maturing uh, finance requirements have been uh, rolled forward as well. Again, a very positive development, uh, which uh, certainly adds to uh, uh, the rally which we have seen in the case of Pakistan Stock Exchange. Low valuations in the market, do you feel that has also uh, contributed as far as the investor confidence is concerned? Yes, yes, certainly. And I think to add to this, uh, the fact that uh, Pakistan has been able to unlock uh, the funds which had to be made available during this uh, quarter from the Asian Development Bank as well as the World Bank. So we have seen large disbursements as well. So in terms of the foreign exchange inflows, uh, this seems like a very positive development. Also, the uh, rotation of institutional money uh, into equities, do you feel that is an important step also because this is a lot, something that some economists are pointing towards? Yes, I think uh, this is uh, not only uh, an important um, a step, but uh, one of the things that, for example, IMF and our uh, uh, lenders wanted to see was uh, the Treasury single account at uh, the public or the government level, you know, this is something which the government has now committed to, and this uh, should actually be a direction towards greater fiscal discipline at a federal as well as the provincial level. All right, Dr. Vakar, our caretaker Prime Minister, Mr. Anwar Ulhab Kakar Saab, uh, today while addressing a ceremony related to the PSX, said that uh, uh, his government vowed to sustain and nurture the growth in the capital market. How sustainable? is this nurturing of growth in the capital market, in your point of view, in the long term? Yes. So I think uh, uh, one or two developments which have taken place during the caretaker time, uh, one, uh, of course, is that there has been issue of, you have seen, uh, the gender bond as well as, of course, regulations around uh, the launching of these bonds by the private sector to raise private finance those regulations have been made easier. Uh, I believe that this is a very important development, uh, helps to mature the capital markets, helps to uh, uh, sort of add to its financial inclusion as well, given that two of the leading local financial institutions were involved in the launch of these bonds. So uh, in, in my view, I believe that uh, this, this uh, uh, Maturity of capital markets that we are seeing now, it was long due. Uh, yes, greater participation is still required. Uh, diversification of financial products available in the capital market is still required. But, uh, but, but the, the, the kind of signaling that the market requires uh, from the government is, is a very welcome step. All right. I'd also like to understand, uh, Dr. Vakar, as far as our Prime Minister's comments are concerned today, he talked about the capital market's resilience and he also uh, lauded the efforts uh, to build a capital market that on not only mirrored economic strength, but also embodied the values of fairness and integrity. What's your take on these comments? Yes. So I think, uh, uh, Omar Sahib, you had yourself said in your initial remarks, you know, that uh, uh, that uh, the signs of slowing down aren't, aren't seen at the moment. So so market has been trying to correct itself for a very long time, and now we are seeing uh, sort of a long bullish rally now. Uh, I, I think that this should allow the domestic investor as well, the foreign investors who are uh, sort of invested in the stock exchange or other financial markets of Pakistan, it should allow all of them to really correct their losses to start with. Second, this, this will also invite additional foreign capital into these markets. Uh, uh, I, I believe that uh, foreign market players are, are looking at this rally very carefully. And for a very long time, they have been bystanders or they haven't invested in the market. Uh, the the, the, the pre-COVID interest uh, should should at least, uh, or, or the levels uh, uh, at which the investors had played in our markets during pre-COVID levels, I think it'll be easier to achieve those levels now. Dr. Vakar, when you talk of the improved economic outlook that our caretaker Prime Minister also highlighted today, uh, what are the measures that need to be taken also once the new government takes over in a couple of months' time as far as continuity of policies of this caretaker government is concerned? Yes, so I think uh, three or four indicators are important. One is 
we are looking at, we are hearing some good news from the agriculture sector. Even today also we learned that a record swing of been done that should set the stage for a bumper crop uh, in the coming months, you know. Uh, second, uh, it is only this week uh, probably we are hearing some uh, good news from the large-scale manufacturing sector as well. We hoping that the trend will continue and the negative large-scale manufacturing growth, which was in last year, uh, that can be reversed this year. Uh, the third good news coming from is uh, the digital sector. Uh, after some time of uh, a downward trend, we are now seeing uh, the, the digital sector exports grow as well. They are not much. Uh, they could be improved further. But the recent measures taken by the government to improve uh, the payment restrictions on those who are importing or exporting digital services, those restrictions are coming to an end or they are being uh, relaxed a bit, and we can readily see that the market is picking that up. So all said and done, I, I think that uh, uh, easing of these regulatory constraints in, in, in all three, agriculture, manufacturing, and services sector, are something which the new government should really look into. Dr. Vakar, we've already discussed when you were here in the studios in the past as well about the ease of doing business and the importance of that in the long run for investor confidence and more investor uh, input uh, into Pakistan's economy. Do you feel that is also something that needs to be looked into at uh, in the short and the long term? Absolutely. Uh, and Umar Sab, I, I feel that uh, for any country, even for the developed countries, ease of doing business remains a work in progress. Uh, I think uh, tax authorities, customs authorities, lending authorities, these are all uh, enablers in, in the business development, entrepreneurship development. Uh, they really need to come together and ensure that the one window that we are promising to our private sector is effective. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Bakar Ahmed, leading economist from Pakistan, joining us and discussing, uh, of course, not only the surge as far as the KSE 100 index is concerned, but also the confidence that the investors are showing as far as Pakistan's economic sectors are concerned and a very positive economic outlook as far as uh, the government is concerned, the initiatives by the current government is concerned, and what our caretaker Prime Minister, Mr. Anwar Lakakas, have also said today at an event related to the PSX. Let's come to our second segment, and that concerns the the Grand Jirga for Peace and Prosperity that was recently held in Balochistan. This special Jirga was held in Balochistan uh, for the very first time in which the Chief Minister of Balochistan, Provincial Ministers, more than 150 tribal elders, scholars, dignitaries and ulema attended. Caretaker Chief Minister Balochistan also uh, gave a special address to this Jirga uh, in which there were also others like a former BNL leader Gulzar Imam Shambay who attended the Jirga and address the gathering. Uh, the Chief Minister of Balochistan uh, talked about uh, the Jirga that has always been an important part of Pakistan's national traditions. He said that even at the time of the formation of Pakistan, our elders came together and wholeheartedly announced their affiliation with this uh, state of uh, uh, Balochistan. And then he said, no matter how serious the problems are, we can always solve them together. Uh, also, the Balochistan government will take the necessary steps to remove obstacles associated with uh, this process, said the Chief Minister of Balochistan. Now, we've been joined by Zahoor Ahmad Buledi. He's a, uh, he's a politician who hails from Balochistan. Buledi Saab, thank you very much uh, to have joined us. Buledi Saab, uh, this, this Jirga, the first of its kind, is very important and uh, comes at a very uh, interesting time as far as Balochistan is concerned. How do you see the developments that took place during this Jirga? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me in your program. Uh, it was a very good initiative taken by Chief Minister of Balochistan, Mr. Ali Mardan Domaki, for peace and prosperity. Uh, actually, it is our uh, tradition that uh, when any issue surface, uh, the Jirga has been called to resolve it. And uh, following that uh, tradition, this uh, particular Jirga has been called to deliberate uh, the peace, which is uh, an unrest in uh, the province. And uh, this was a very good initiative. And uh, many people across Balochistan and uh, tribal elders who have attended this Jirga and discussed uh, the issues related to the peace and security. So 
it was very welcoming and a good uh, initiative taken by the caretaker government. Mr. Buledi, uh, our uh, Chief Minister Baluchistan says the Jirga has always been an important part of our national traditions. Do you feel this is also an important uh, part of the continuity of traditions as far as Baluchistan is concerned? Yes, it is the part of our Baluch tradition. Whenever any issue comes, uh, the tribal elders and uh, the uh, society uh, important members call a Jirga to resolve the issue. As you are very well aware, that Baluchistan is going through a, a low intensity insurgency, uh, which is being pampered by foreign and hostile agencies. And uh, you see the terrorist activities in Baluchistan. To counter all these uh, unrest, uh, the, it was planned by the Kataka government to call a jirga uh, of tribal elders and uh, important members of the society to discuss the issue. The people who have been involved and who are uh, upset with the system, uh, the Jirga would reach out to them and convince them for their mainstreaming. And I think it was a very good uh, initiative. So it should be continued and the discussion and debate and negotiation should be held in future. All right. Uh, also, Mr. Buledi, former provincial minister Nawab Muhammad Khan Shahwani at the Jirga said, and I quote, that committees need to be formed to resolve tribal and government disputes. Are committees the way forward? Should other mechanisms be involved as well? As you see, the Baluchistan issue, political reconciliation is very much required. If you reconcile with the, all those groups, who are involved in insurgency and who are uh, not good with the, the system and the government. So they need to be involved. They need to be engaged with the uh, negotiations. So uh, Mr. Shawani was very much right. The committees should be formed, uh, who should be mandated to reach out all those uh, people who are very much upset and who are estranged uh, with the system. They need to be convinced and they should, uh, they should be mainstreamed. All right. Also, Mr. Buledi, the Balochistan chief minister said that the government will welcome those who were in the mountains to come back, quote, unquote. How important is the mainstreaming of all those who have, been, who have gone to a, another side and, of course, their contribution to further peace in Balochistan? It is very much uh, required that we have to identify the culprits, number one, and all we should engage all those groups who are upset with the system. So we have to adopt multi-dimensional approach in resolving Baluchistan issue. All right. Mr. Buledi, there were many other important members also present in the Jirga, including uh, the caretaker provincial uh, interior minister, uh, Mir Zubair Jamali. There was also the caretaker provincial minister, Sardar Ijaz Ahmed Jafar. How important is uh, getting together of all these current and former uh, leaders in Balochistan to evolve a strategy for the betterment and for us the strengthening of uh, the region that is Balochistan. And uh, if, if what in your point of view, because you are also an important part of it, are the measures that need to be taken in the short term and in the long term for Balochistan by Balochistan government as well as by the federal government? Uh, there must be evolved uh, so many policies, so short-term policy and long-run policy. Uh, for the short-term policy and long-run policy, Jirga should discuss all these policies. And uh, you are rightly pointed out that these uh, important figures uh, who, uh, do, who, who have attended this uh, Jirga, uh, the, uh, the purpose of this uh, Jirga was to sort out uh, the uh, problems of the Pakistan. So we should work on uh, many strategies and short-term strategy, we can reach out to people uh, who are involved in this uh, insurgency and this terrorist activities. And also the Jirga should deliberate on the root causes of uh, all these issues which has been uh, created for the last two decades. 
uh, let also uh, finally, Mr. Buledi, I'd like to understand this jirga has been very important as you have yourself described in, uh, so, uh, in so many words. D do you feel there is also a need for having these jirgas on a regular level uh, so that all the differences can be resolved, so that the province can move forward in the right direction, looking at the opinions of all the different parties concerned? Jirga could be a, a good uh, factor uh, to resolve uh, these issues. So, uh, no doubt, uh, it has uh, to be mandated by the government, both uh, federal and provincial, and other stakeholders. So, they could reach out all those uh, people who are not uh, good with the government. So, it is a good initiative, and its mandates need to be enhanced. And it's, it should be continued. Uh, it was uh, held in Quetta, but in other part of the province, it should be held. So the people should deliberate. And many committees should be formed from the Jirga. And they could be given the power uh, to discuss and to reach out all those uh, people and groups and get their issues resolved, uh, provided that, that they should be, uh, accept the boundaries of Pakistan and the constitution of Pakistan. As far as a constitution is concerned, uh, so it could be amended by, uh, by the time with the consultation of all political parties, but they have to accept the boundaries of Pakistan and solidity and security of Pakistan. All right, thank you very much, Zahur Ahmed Buledi Saab, a politician healing from Baluchistan, joining us all the way uh, from the province and, of course, highlighting the importance of the Jirga that was recently held in Baluchistan with many important tribal elders and politicians getting together in order to form a consensus as far as uh, uh, how to take Baluchistan forward is concerned in the current circumstances and, of course, the, uh, the way forward that is, of course, development, that is, of course, peace uh, in Baluchistan and that is something that was highlighted by all the different parties concerned that were part of that Jirga in uh, Balochistan. Chief Minister of Balochistan was there, provincial ministers were there, more than 150 tribal elders, scholars, dignitaries and ulema were also there who attended uh, that uh, meeting. And of course, uh, the consensus is there and the consensus is very important for Balochistan and that is what was shown in this Jirga that took place. Let's come to our third segment, ladies and gentlemen, and that concerns the uh, latest updates as far as uh, Gaza is concerned or Israel is concerned. This is day 63 as far as uh, the atrocities on Palestinians is concerned and those uh, atrocities continue not only in northern Gaza, not only in southern Gaza but also in the West Bank. As far as the number of killed or wounded is concerned, just let me give you a little, uh, some of the numbers in Gaza. It's 17,177, it's 46,000 have been wounded. In the, the, the people who've been killed, more than 6,000 are children. In the occupied West Bank, 266 people have been killed, while 3,365 people have been wounded. Uh, Israeli bombing and land incursion has continued, just focusing on the northern end of the Gaza Strip. After the resumption of hostilities, the southern part of Gaza also, supposedly, that was meant to be a safe area for civilians, has also been facing uh, violence from the Israeli side. The United Nations officials term the uh, situation as apocalyptic. The World Health Organization terms it humanity's darkest hour. The United Nations Security Council is to also vote on a UAE a drafted resolution uh, calling for Gaza ceasefire amid US opposition to any action. Pakistan and the OIC are also pressing the United Nations Security Council to adopt this uh, UAE drafted resolution for ceasefire in Gaza. Uh, but uh, as a lot of people are saying, uh, and a lot of um, analysts are also saying uh, in Gaza, the most brutal tactics of the Third Reich genocide, genocidal violence and cleansing are now being replicated by the children of Holocaust survivors and that seems to be a very strange attitude coming from them. The United Nations Sec Secretary General Antonio Guterres has also invoked Article 99 of the UN Charter urging the United Nations Security Council to act on this war in Gaza. This is a very rare move that has been made by the United Nations Secretary General and of course it all depends on how now all eyes on what the United Nations Security Council is going to move as far as the resolution that has been backed by the UAE is concerned. The Israeli bombardment of Gaza now ranks amongst the worst assaults on any civilian population 
in our time and age. This is, has been said, quote unquote, by Norwegian Refugee Council Chief Jan Egeland. Uh, also, Israeli Defense Minister Yuav Gallant says that the attack on Gaza South is going to surpass the northern operation despite the American pressure that is going against it. So you see very well the intentions that Israel has as far as uh, uh, the, the war on Palestine is concerned. Southern Gaza, as I told you, the ground offensives are increasing uh, by uh, Israel. This is, a, a, going to, this is leading in a surge of the Palestinians who have been killed. And of course, I gave you the figures in the very beginning, more than 17,000, in fact, 17,177. And the number increases by every passing minute. Bernie Sanders in the United States, we know him as a politician, has opposed the USA to Israel over rights violation. Uh, but uh, whether the, U, uh, the U.S. Uh, or the government uh, looks into it or addresses it is another thing altogether. The GCC has expressed deep concern over the blatant Israeli aggression. The Qatar Amir has also slammed the shameful inaction on the Gaza crisis. Qatar's Prime Minister has called for an immediate, comprehensive and impartial international investigation into what he referred to as Israeli crimes in Gaza. And when you look at Israeli crimes in Gaza also, you cannot deny the number of people, not only uh, the, from the civilian population, but also from the journalistic community, also from the humanitarian community, part of the NGOs who have been uh, killed blatantly by the Israeli forces. And this despite the fact that the humanitarian organizations working in Gaza had supplied the Israeli forces with their geotag information. So the Israeli forces knew exactly who they were striking when they struck the humanitarian organizations. A lot of uh, different uh, you know, points of views coming from different parts of the, uh, of the world, but there is one general consensus that this humanitarian uh, issue that has baffled the world as far as uh, Palestine is concerned, Gaza is concerned, West Bank is concerned, needs to end. There needs to be some form of ceasefire or a truce that can be extended to a longer period of time so that the people can heave a sigh of relief. We've been joined by Johar Salim. He's a former foreign secretary in the studios. Thank you very much, Johar Saab, to have joined us. Day 63, Johar Saab, 17,177 dead. And the number is going to increase even by tomorrow, even in an hour or so. Uh, how important is the United Nations Security Council meeting that is going on as we speak? I mean, the United Nations have had a number of meetings on this issue. Unfortunately, they haven't really provided a great deal of relief. Although, as we know, the United Nations Security Council, uh, the, one of the principal organ, organs of the UN, was set up for s these very situations hmm. um, to stop conflicts, uh, to resolve conflicts uh, through peaceful means where possible, or to halt them by, um, by force, by, using, uh, by use of force. Unfortunately, because of the veto power of permanent members of the UN, over the years, what we've seen is that the body has not been very effective, neither in stopping such conflicts or halting uh, by use of force or by uh, peaceful negotiations. In this particular instance, um, we have seen a lot of diplomacy taking place recently within the United Nations, outside the United Nations, uh, the, the important countries in the conflict, other than the Israelis, the, the Americans, um, then influential countries like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, um, some European powers, they're all playing their part. Qatar. Qatar, of course, which, is, which hosts the, <coughs> uh, the leadership of Hamas, the political leadership of Hamas as well. Um, but the problem is that the the goals of Israel, the goal of Israel seems to be, if not reoccupation of Gaza uh, permanently, as the Israeli Prime Minister has said himself, that they want to have the security control of Gaza, which basically means... Mm -hmm. That they want the Israeli army in, uh, in Gaza. Exactly, um, which basically means an occupation mm. uh, for an indefinite period. Mm. So if that is the goal, how would the United Nations Security Council um, prevail upon Israel, particularly when the Americans, the Amer and, uh, and we know there's a record of decades and decades whereby the Americans support Israel within the UN, within the United Nations Security Council, 
and they are never hesitant to use the veto power uh, if it really comes to that. So in this type of a situation, I don't really see uh, the diplomacy, in the short term at least, succeeding in the UN in terms of a permanent ceasefire. Now when we talk about humanitarian pauses, as uh, the term has been um, used because it, this term has been used recently, or let's say uh, short-term truces, mm -hmm. that we have seen, uh, that would suit Israel as well because uh, the Hamas still has a number of Israeli hostages. Uh, then again, there's a lot of international pressure on Israel. There's a lot of pre uh, international pressure on the US uh, from the Muslim countries, but not just from the Muslim countries, from the European countries as well, where we, s we saw hundreds of thousands of people demonstrating on the streets, mm. um, as we saw in London or Berlin and other many other um, capitals of Europe. So in this situation, I think what seems more likely is that the diplomacy outside the United Nations Security Council might actually produce something um, in the short term, which would provide some humanitarian relief to the people of Gaza. Um, but I don't really see a permanent ceasefire at this mm. point in time. All right. I would like to also refer to what the director of UNRWA Affairs in Gaza, Thomas White, says. He says civil order is breaking down in Gaza. Uh, do you see or you, do you foresee some kind of a, uh, an increased civil unrest as well in the coming days if the current situation continues? I mean, this is ca chaos mm. that we see in Gaza. Um, Gaza is being... Uh, I mean, systematically, the infrastructure is being destroyed. Mm. Um, the, the innocent uh, casualties, as you've mentioned yourself, uh, have uh, climbed to the tune of 17,000 or more, mm. uh, and there are a number of injured as well. Um, then again, we see a situation where there's no utilities, no uh, basic amenities of life. Health uh, facilities, humanitarian aid is know, crumbling as we speak. Exactly. So in this type of a situation, uh, Gaza is in a dire need uh, of humanitarian relief. But you might have seen that statement coming from the UN humanitarian chief, mm. who says that you know our operations there are pra practically uh, they are practically seized. Mm. So he I says you cannot even term it humanitarian aid anymore. That, that's true. Mm. So in this type of a situation, I think that there is a very critical uh, need for. Uh, Muslim countries to continue with the diplomacy that they are undertaking. Mm. I think so Saudi Arabia in particular and uh, MBS or, or the Crown Prince mm. and Prime Minister of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Sulman, mm. he has been very active. Um, Saudi Foreign Minister has been very active. You know, they've had a summit of Arab and Muslim leaders in Saudi Arabia. Then uh, the um, Saudi Foreign Minister he has been undertaking visits to the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. And of course, behind the scenes, a lot of um, back channel diplomacy is taking place as well. I think there's a need for a more concerted action by the Muslim countries on the, on the one hand, then uh, the European countries need to take greater interest. And then within the, the US, I think on the positive side, I must say that the, the voices now emanating from some, uh, from some of the US leadership, for instance, Antony Blinken, the mm. Secretary of State, mm. has recently said that there's a gap between the Israeli intent and what he meant was the Israeli, uh, the so-called intent. Bernie or, or Sanders has also been very vocal as far as uh, this uh, humanitarian situation in Gaza is concerned. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Bernie Sanders, of course, is not part of the US administration. He isn't. He isn't. But Antony Blinken is, is mm. a critical part of, you know, like he's the Secretary of State. Mm. So he is the top uh, diplomat, uh, top American diplomat in the world right now. So he has come up with a statement that, that, that there's a gap between the intent and what is happening on the ground. Mm. If the intent is to save civilian lives, that is. Mm. I think even a stronger statement has come from Lloyd Austin, the mm. Secretary of Defense, who has said that Israel is losing the battle of, uh, I mean, words to the fact, the battle of hearts and minds in Gaza. And it might be, uh, you know, they might in the end get a tactical victory, but it would be a strategic defeat. You know, now these are very strong words coming from a, a US Secretary of Defense. So I, what I see is an increasing pressure from the US as well, behind the scenes, 
Uh, I think in the recent, uh, you know, there, there are media reports that in the recent deliberations or meetings between the U.S. and Israel, there have been greater pressure uh, to, to protect civilian lives. Because, see, this is giving a bad name not just to Israel, but to America as well. Hmm. Because when they use their veto power in the UN Security Council, uh, or, or not even a veto power, when they oppose any move for a permanent ceasefire, th then the world is watching. And America's position becomes very delicate because America has always been, um, you know, like they've always uh, been and claimed uh, to, be a, to be a champion of human rights in the world to be champion of uh, freedoms, or the four freedoms, as we say. Mm. So I think it is um, th the war of international public opinion is being fought um, in the hearts and minds of people everywhere. You said war of, uh, you know, uh, uh, people uh, that is being fought. Uh, that is the being international fought, public in, international opinion. Public opinion of also is being, uh, you know, fought as we speak. When you talk of international public opinion, do you feel that this opinion can affect the policies that the governments who are siding with Israel uh, have, do you feel that could change in the coming days as well because of this increased or forged public opinion? I mean, it, it definitely influences, if not in the short term, in the, in the medium term and in the long term, it always does. Because we have to remember that in the West, you know, these countries are democracies. Mm. And democ in democracies, the political leaderships are very vulnerable to, the, to public opinion. Netanyahu himself is in a very difficult situation within Israel. Uh, they declare, uh, right now he claims he, to be... He already is, has a, a case on him that, is, that has begun. And there are different people within uh, the, uh, the you know, political ambit of Israel that are uh, also criticizing Netanyahu. Yeah. I mean, I had, in my previous uh, interaction, uh, you know, like here in PTV World and other channels, I had emphasized upon two things. First, that, you know, we can expect uh, reckless behavior from Netanyahu. Because he but has already seen that. that <laughs> exactly, did. that's what I was going to say. You see, and we have seen that. I've been s saying mm. it since the inception of this crisis. Mm. And the second thing is that he knows that you know, like this might be the end of his political career. Mm. And now he wants. You see, the, the, the two uh, sort of you know ways before him. One is a revival of his political fortunes, which is very difficult, and very seemingly impossible at this point in time. Mm. But you know, like, but he's a great survivor. The second is to leave his legacy, mm -hmm. you know, to leave his legacy as the strongest leader. And but you know, you talk of uh, the leg leaving a leg legacy and, you know, his political survival and uh, uh, the fact remains that what kind of political survival is he going to have in a couple of years time or what kind of legacy is going to leave in a couple of years time when people are going to reflect on what happened in Gaza in 2023 and the devastation that was caused, not only in other terms, but leave uh, the rest on humanitarian terms as far as, uh, you know, the lack of water, food facilities, killing innocent children, women are concerned. Do you feel this is a legacy? Unfortunately, uh, you know, people um, have their own way of thinking. Mm, you're right. People you see know? the other side of the coin as well. So they mm. basically, he'll be seeing uh, it as sort of, you know, acting as a strong man, you mm. know. And, and you see, this is not the first time Israel has had a military action. We have to remember that. Mm. In Gaza, there have been military actions in the past. 2014 as well. How can 2014, we remember? 2014, 2012, mm. two, uh, 2008, 2009. Mm. But none of those actions were as devastating. But of course, this has been in response to something which was devastating itself. So, so I think uh, there is a context to it. Uh, but this is going to change a lot in Gaza. Uh, Hamas, I don't really see them surviving in terms of, mm. uh, you know, like administrating, uh, okay. administering mm. Gaza anymore. Mm. I think this is something that Israel would. I've been saying that in mm. my previous interviews as well, and I'll say, say it again. I think Israel. Uh, at, at, at no cost would accept that now. Um, but you know, at what cost government. are they doing this? They say that they are going towards a uh, certain political party or organization, but innocent people are being massacred in the whole bargain, and you are still leaving the whole, uh, uh, you know, strip in in a situation that many have called uh, in dire straits. And you know, it's it's uh, there is a black uh, future as far as Gaza is concerned. At least let the humanitarian aid in. At least don't touch the hospitals, don't touch the educational institutions, don't touch the uh, even uh, you know the mosques. You, uh, when you look at what is happening in Al-Aqsa Mosque, are, people are still being denied 
the, especially the youth, to go and pray at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, you've got the Israeli police who does not want people to put up posts on social media. They don't want the Palestinian flag up. I mean, these are just small examples, or even Israeli settlers that are now getting into small villages and uh, they're harming the lives of uh, Palestinians. This is a continuation of what Netanyahu and his far-right government began. When will this end and how will this end in your point of view? It's a very complicated situation. Um, we know this crisis, uh, I mean, this conflict has been going on for 75 years now. Mm. And uh, there seems to be no end in sight. Now, some analysts felt that this, um, you know, like this is a huge challenge. And of course, this, this is a tragedy, what we see uh, unfolding there in Gaza. But it, it could be a, an opportunity as well to restart the peace process, uh, which had faltered. Uh, you know, the Oslo Accords in the 90s, and then in 2005. And that led to the creation of, you know, to the autonomy mm. in, in Gaza and the West Bank and the government of Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. And in, and in fact, in Gaza as well, mm. it was the Palestinian Authority which mm. had the government. Mm. And then Hamas basically, like, you know, they, they ousted them in an election and subsequently through um, uh, some sort of a sort of you know like popular uh, some sort of an uprising you could say against the Pal Palestinian Authority. So the thing is, I think now is the time for the for the world leaders to see it as an opportunity. And uh, after this military action ends, and I think it would not end before Israel ensures that Hamas is totally out of uh, power. But you know, there. again, my question will be again: at what cost? The cost. You know, the, the cost already the cost is 17,177 civilians. The cost is the destruction of houses, buildings, hospitals. The cost is denial of water, food, electricity, fuel to the people in Gaza. Uh, isn't this, I mean, I, you know, in the beginning of, uh, while I was introducing the segment, saying that uh, the, the Third Reich did exactly more or less the same thing in more violent manners or in the same manner. Now, the children of the Holocaust, uh, I have to say that on record, are doing exactly the same thing, perpetrating the same kind of atrocities to pe the, the children and the women in Palestine. Uh, have they not learnt from the past? Now, this, I mean, what the point that you mentioned, I think it's, uh, I mean, it's very unfortunate and, and, and very true that, you know, that the cost that we see there is staggering, you know, the casualties that are happening. But then, unfortunately, this was not something which was unexpected, at least, you know, I, I had sort of, you know, previously. Um, but did you like expect so many people, uh, so many casualties? Unfortunately, yes. This okay. is this is okay. exactly what I had indicated because I had said that uh, Netanyahu's actions would be reckless mm. and they would lead to literally like thousands and thousands of casualties. Now, unfortunately, you see, but having said that, I was in London recently and I saw something very interesting there. You know, there was those marches where mm -hmm. hundreds and thousands mm -hmm. of people mm -hmm. walked in the streets, you know, uh, calling for uh, ceasefire, permanent ceasefire and calling for an end to this sort of, you know, this... Um, brutal aggression. Um, and you know who marched there? Okay, a lot of Muslims, mm. but again, a lot of Christians. A lot of Jews as and well. And a lot of Jewish people. Mm, 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 so mm. the Jewish, you see, we have to remember that there are a lot of liberal Jewish mm. people in America mm, as well. Mm, mm, mm. And there are a lot of Jewish people who do not believe in Zionism, number mm. one, and who do not support uh, these type of fascist policies by mm. Israel. So I think we, we, we cannot really sort of, you know, like, uh, encapsulate all the Jewish under I, one I umbrella. I totally agree with you on that, but we need to also encapsulate what the Israeli government or what Netanyahu's government is doing. Thank you so very much. We're a bit short of time. Uh, Johan Salim Saab, thank you so very much to have joined us. We'll continue having your insight as far as this conflict is concerned sure. in the coming days as well. All we want is some kind of a ceasefire to begin that leads to uh, a two-state solution or any solution to be implemented as far as Palestine is concerned. Thank you, sir, to have thank joined you. us. Let's come to our last two stories very quickly. The first concerns Hunter Biden, the son of Joe Biden, who's been indicted later Thursday on multiple counts of tax evasion. The second time this year, uh, the President Joe Biden's troubled son has been charged for a special counsel investigating his personal and business dealings. He has been engaged in a four year scheme to not pay at least 1.4 million US dollars in self assessed federal taxes he owed for nearly uh, tax years 2016 
through uh, 2019. Uh, Biden was also charged with nine counts of failing to file and pay taxes, tax evasion and filing tax returns. This was shown in the indictment. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about our last story and that concerns uh, the peace deal that has uh, come forward between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Now, both say they will move towards normalizing relations and will exchange prisoners captured during recent fighting in nagorno karabakh Two neighbors have been involved in decades-long conflict over the disputed territory. In a joint statement that was released last night, both countries said they saw a historical chance for long-awaited peace. They also said they hope to sign a peace treaty by the end of the year. Let's hope this happens and let's hope this example of Armenia and Azerbaijan lays the ground for peace in other situations as well. And I'll count uh, Palestinian situation in the first of this land, followed by others like Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. With that, we come to an end of today's news. And we'll see you inshallah on Monday when news story segments are pertaining to us here in Pakistan. Stay safe, have a wonderful weekend. Allah Hafiz.